complete destruction, chaos, confusion. We can't control Mother Nature. It's happened before. Within two years, we had two very significant fires in Waldo Canyon and Black Forest. It will happen again. The wildfire threat here is still very real. Our firefighters are taking lessons learned. The training is more advanced than ever. It's dirty, it's hot, it's ex extremely exhausting. The work is more intense. It's long days, long hours. Now, only on News 5, behind the scenes at Fire Camp, we walk you step by step through the training, the dedication of wildland firefighters, men and women whose sole focus is to protect lives and homes in Southern Colorado. This is a KOAA News 5 special presentation, Fireline, Southern Colorado's wildfire outlook. Hi there, I'm Sam Kramer with this News 5 special report, Fireline, readiness and response, your in-depth look at the real wildfire risk in Colorado Springs, understanding how fire behaves in our area and checking in on firefighters who prepare around the clock to protect this place we call home. Now, before we get into the details here, here's why it's important. We've already experienced the worst case scenario with national attention during the Waldo Canyon fire. That fire back in 2012 reduced 346 homes to ash, and the threat for a repeat remains in other parts of the city. Fire everywhere, burning buildings everywhere, complete destruction, chaos, confusion, cars abandoned on the side of the road, cars on fire. It was just utterly unbelievable, the destruction. Even with the backdrop of a nighttime sky, when fires tend to cool down, there wasn't much Colorado Springs firefighters could do. Flames already entered the Mountain Shadows neighborhood on the city's west side, flattening homes as residents evacuated. It was just devastating that thought in the back of your mind that that's my city, that that's I'm supposed to be protecting that. They're looking to us. Their work was only beginning. It was the first full call out in the fire department's history and rightfully so as flames jumped from house to house. Some of the fire behavior was things that I'd never seen before. 18 days passed before the Waldo Canyon fire was finally contained. The damage was already done. Two people were killed. 346 homes were lost. Insurance claims totaling more than $450 million. It's the most significant wildfire the city has ever endured, though the threat remains high. The wildland urban interface where homes and buildings meet the forest extends across the city not just west of I-25. We have thousands of homes in our area that stretch from north uh, up in the Peregrine area, clear down south into Cheyenne Mountain that are all threatened when we have wildland fires. Between overgrown vegetation, terrain, and a number of homes, Cheyenne Mountain poses a threat similar to what happened with Waldo Canyon. It's a completely different threat on the east side of the city where the speed of grass fires is an even bigger problem. Those fine, flashy fields, the grass and the shrubs burn quick, and the wind blows a lot harder on that side. So it has the potential to take out a lot of infrastructure and homes before we can get our resources in the right places. That's why CSFD trains all of its firefighters, including those just joining the ranks, on the basics of wildland firefighting. We're more of when this happens instead of if this happens. So we've always planned for this to happen. So. When Waldo Canyon took place, we were ready for it simply because that was, it's when it's going to happen. Ensuring they'll be even more ready should a full call out ever happen again. And for the basis of this story, we joined the department's largest training academy for a week-long wildland firefighting session broken down into a number of modules. They include structure protection when wildfires threaten homes and buildings. Firefighters also learn how to use pumps and hoses in the field as these fires often burn in areas where water is limited. Now to that end, we spent time driving, practicing how to drive some of their wildland trucks, those brush trucks in rough terrain. The week ends with a mock fire scenario where all of the classroom learning from the first part of camp is put to use on simulated fires, but nothing is more important than this right here, fire behavior. It's the first lesson taught in camp as understanding the signs a fire is giving dictates how best to fight it. Check it out. Wow, look at that. <laughs> Wildfires, they are more complex than simply showing up and putting out the flames. Containing them is truly a science. All the teaching we do are building blocks. 
We want to build a really good foundation. So they need to understand something about fire behavior and what causes it. The foundation lies in knowing what the fire is doing through a number of signs it can give. For instance, how fast it's moving, the color of smoke rising from the flames, even the direction of that smoke all tell firefighters something. They also tie into the weather associated with that fire. We look at the fire, we see where's it been, where's it right now, where's it going based on primarily weather. So the biggest factor there is wind, but also going to be um, relative humidity. Wildfires need three elements to ignite, oxygen, heat, and fuel. So high temperature days when our fuels have dried out, combined with heavy winds, provide an ample opportunity for larger growth. It also dictates how firefighters will respond in removing one of those elements either directly on the flames or indirectly, establishing a larger perimeter around the active fire to contain it. We can't control Mother Nature. We can't control the terrain, the topography we work, we're working in. We can't control the weather, but we can control the fuels. And so that's what we do, and that's what really our, most of our tactics are designed around. Another factor particularly important across southern Colorado is terrain and knowing how fire behaves in certain spots. Generally, fire burns faster moving upslope than down, while canyons, especially narrow ones, pose a huge hazard as the winds accelerate through them, spreading flames at a faster pace. They're also keeping a close eye on flame lengths, the literal behavior of the flame and fuels it's burning through. Firefighters are at their best fighting flames on the ground. So if a fire reaches the top of trees known as crowning, it becomes much harder to fight and in turn requiring a change of tactics moving forward. Now most of us are familiar with what a fire department's response to a structure fire looks like, but it's completely different in wildland where firefighters must be mobile in case of a sudden change on that fire and they don't really have the resources to enter a burning building. Their primary objective, protect as many savable homes as they can. The Waldo Canyon fire made the Mountain Shadows neighborhood look like a war zone. Their streets lined with burning homes, increasing damage, stress, and the fire size. The buildings themselves, the structures can become fuel. And that's what we experienced on the Waldo fire was that those buildings themselves were actually propagating the fire further and further into the city. El Paso County and the city adapted fire codes following that fire, banning wood siding and decks on new construction. With nearly half of all Coloradans living in the wildland urban interface, the demand to protect structures is as high as it's ever been. But firefighting manpower, even with the benefit of time, can't keep up. We can manipulate the fire environment to make sure that it's not only safe for us, but safe for the structures in the fire environment so they can almost protect themselves because we don't have enough firefighters and there's not enough fire engines in the state to put one in every driveway and, and you know protect them as the fire hits. The structure triage and structure protection, that's what we need to be good at as Car Springs firefighters when you guys come out. Since Waldo, CSFD established a structure triage plan so firefighters can quickly evaluate structures, decide how best to protect them and carry on. Captain Steve Oswald taught that plan as part of our field exercise, speaking from experience on Waldo, the Black Forest fire and more. We had homes that we saved, homes that were standing one day and then we're on the ground the next day with no fire front going into them. Now, firefighters must decide whether the building fits into one of three categories, not threatened, threatened and defensible, or threatened and not defensible. That category dictates their response. If it's defensible, firefighters scan the property, looking to remove any fuel that could potentially ignite the structure and establish a safety zone to go to if needed. They may also spray the building down as well as the ground around it to cool it before the fire hits. But if a property has no defensible space, is fire prone, and can't be safely protected, firefighters will examine other structures that carry a lower risk. Structures are important. People's valuables are important. We've sworn an oath to protect our city and to protect our citizens, but we don't want to die doing it. A tree, grass, isn't worth somebody's life. When we have a major incident, we only have so many resources available. We've seen the training, the dedication of fire crews to save homes and lives, but even with all of that knowledge, you and I also play a vital role in helping fire crews where it matters most. The steps you can take right now still ahead on Fireline Readiness and Response. 
Welcome back. The fire service traditionally recognizes six types of engines based on their size and the amount of water they can hold. This one you probably recognize it's a type one engine. This was used to battle structure fires and traffic accidents within the city. But when it comes to wildfire, Springs Fire relies on a pair of other apparatus. It's a type three engine and a type six brush truck. It allows them mobility while still having the option to actually have water with them in the field. We also learn how they refill those tanks when hydrants aren't available. No matter the fire, there is no better resource for Colorado Springs firefighters than water. Colorado Springs Fire Department has a great water supply in the city, but once you are away from hydrants and that sort of thing, you need to be very cautious with where you're using it and how you're using that water. It's their main tool to contain wildfires within the city, emphasizing the importance for our fire camp to learn how best to utilize water in the field. <coughs> either through a brush truck or larger type 3 engine. They have to get their hands on the hose. They have to get their hands on the pump and actually operate this stuff to know how to do it. Brush trucks are all about mobility. We have backpacks with uh, pre-laid out hoses that we can attach to the pumps on the back. It's very simple to operate and we can set it up very quickly so that we can make a hit on a fire pack it up really quickly. They also allow a small team of firefighters to pump and roll, spraying water on the fire while still moving, helping to cool down or reinforce a fire's flank. What's our water level at? But they can only carry 300 gallons, requiring firefighters be aware of their water usage. In wildland firefighting, we have to use water conservatively. We treat the fuels around first. So what happens when they run out? They have a few options, including drafting with a type three engine. Once it starts running, turn, drop your choke down and then start throttling up. We learned how to do that in the field using a, a hard suction hose, putting water from a, from a static water source into the tank and then using that. Shake it up and down. Utilizing a separate pump, firefighters could then fill a separate truck, or as we did, let it rip attach a nozzle and use it to spray water. Aside from using brush trucks to impact a wildfire, the vehicle itself poses its own challenges. And one of the best parts of fire camp involved learning how to drive off road in these trucks. Photojournalist AJ Vega takes us through it. It handles differently than a car. It handles differently than a, than a small or mid-size or even large pickup truck. These are really large dualies, some of them, with ex especially wide um, axle to axle length. So yeah, it took some getting used to, but I think we mastered that pretty well by the end of the day. Learn the capabilities of the vehicle, and specifically with our Type 6 brush trucks, they have a high center of gravity, so we need to be careful, especially when we're going over a bump. There's you know, your break over, your approach angle, your departure angle, you need to take all those into account. The turning radius of the vehicle, so making, making light. They're going to put me just acting like an And idiot. also using spotters oh, for man. safety when we can't see over a ridge. That's, you know, safety is important to us. And we I nailed it, sir. Off-road driving, that was a lot of fun. Communication with the driver is the most important thing. Being able to keep eye contact and being aware of your surrounding situational awareness. You're, you're their eyes outside of the vehicle. We'll be right back. This is a KOAA News 5 special presentation. Fireline, Southern Colorado's wildfire outlook. Now, this week-long wildfire class includes handwritten tests and a hands-on one in the field. Now, there are also mock fire simulations for us to take part in and prove that we absorbed all the information that they threw at us. Everything from directly attacking a fire to the worst case scenario. Community is about 74, winds out of the south, southeast, 10 to It begins with a briefing, with said, just like a real incident. Cold. Winds out of the north. Broken into teams, that's where we receive our assignment, protecting structures downwind from the fire. But first, our squad boss establishes a plan for safety, a necessity, before we even start working. The escape route is going to be on this road here, and uh, if need be, we can move up to the road to the main road, 85, 87. These sessions were designed with minimum impact suppression tactics, so we didn't actually protect the home as thoroughly as we would have in a real fire. Still, we checked it for any opening embers could find. Yeah, we just make sure all those windows are closed. Check this one. 
Yep, windows closed. Burkhart, copy. Once that was complete, we were sent to a spot fire. That's the term for flames burning outside of the main fire. <laughs> which were eventually contained without any further problems before switching to the other component of the simulations, digging line and directly attacking the fire. It moved, it moved. There's not a lot of glamour in wildland firefighting. Um, it's dirty, it's hot. It's ex extremely exhausting. It's long days, long hours, and uh, often we don't have regular meals when we're out there. The tactic of digging line isn't often used in Colorado Springs. There isn't a ton of open space for it, but it's popular with the Forest Service and other entities as a way of providing a fuel break. We can make that line anywhere from 12 inches wide and we can make it on, on bigger three or four foot wide based on the fuel that is in the area. Incident the Command had us extend the line dug by the morning session, and scraping down to mineral soil, utilizing a variety of hand tools and working together to balance the workload. And working with a whole bunch of other people, keeping your spacing right, being aware of what the other guys tools uh, are doing in relation to your position so that we avoid injury. <laughs> Still, our squad did have to respond to an injury, tending to this man and communicating with incident command to get him proper medical attention. Open fracture to a lower leg. Oh, uh, we got crews on it getting medical. Before going back to the line, resuming our digging with the other crews. After that, the scenario firefighters wish never to be a part of. Put your feet towards the road. Feet towards the road. The idea with shelters is it's a last resort. We don't want to deploy those unless we have to. With a simulated change in the fire's direction, we were forced to deploy. Lay down, lay down, lay down. The adrenaline dump does hit, and you're running, you're running, and then they say, drop, we're going to deploy here. But I think in the moment, the training that we had, that's why we train, is to, um, to be able to, in an emergency, in a, in a high, high, uh, high intensity later, environment later, later. like that, know how to operate, and I think we displayed that very well. It's an important close to the exercise to show just how dangerous the job can be, providing a feel for the stress and emotion they may soon experience with real flames. And if we don't train, in conditions like that, and if we don't have hands-on training, we're not gonna perform well under that stress. Now the simulations, including the injury, were the final component to this week-long Wildland Fire Academy. And next on Fireland, I'll take you step-by-step -step through your role in protecting your own home and potentially saving lives. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Mother Nature limits how firefighters can respond, but any effort you, the homeowner or business owner, can put forward to make your property more defensible will help in the long run. So let's run through what that mitigation would look like. First, this home is a bad example. Let's show you why. This cluster of trees right here next to the home is a huge hazard. Flames reach the top of those trees. Your house is in real danger. Second, this mulch, this dirt type area right around the house, it's popular landscaping, but it's flammable. Crews would need to scrape that away from your home. And really, overgrown grass is never a good idea. It just provides that fire more fuel. So let's go to a different example. Second house. It's better, but it's not the best. Notice there's more space. Those trees that were here are gone. More space close to the house. That's always a good thing. It lowers the chance embers have to jump from tree to tree. They do have some shrubs. It's somewhat close to the house here. Those would require attention, but still not all that bad. Overall, it's defensible, but not the best. Finally, here is your best example. And I think really you can see why. It's okay to have trees on your property, but notice they are at least 20 feet away from the structure that allows that adequate spacing really lowers your threat. Now, instead of mulch, they have stone. Stone isn't flammable, so there's nothing to worry about there. The grass also cut again limits the fuel for that fire to chew up and the driveway clearly marked so they have a fuel break and access point with that stone. We have tons of resources online for you to check out what you can do with your property, your home. In the meantime, thanks for watching this News 5 special report, Fireline Readiness and Response. I'm Sam Kramer. Have a good night.